right, here we go. Another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I am your host, Fadi Kudair, local realtor with Sutton Group Ottawa. And this is your show where every business has a voice. Uh, today, we're bringing on the show Patty Murphy from Youth Services Bureau of Ottawa. And I just wanted to kind of ask you some of the, uh, obviously, the, you're, you're serving four different categories, four different pillars as far as the youth services. And each one of those will have its own challenges mm -hmm. and its own concerns. What are some of the challenges that you're having in, let's say, mental health mm -hmm. uh, today for youth services? Yeah, I think it's uh, always making sure that people reach out to us before it's a crisis. Mm -hmm. And so funding, you know, we're always we're always fundraising for mental health. It's a big focus for us as a foundation team as well. Uh, but it really is, you know, it's it's raising enough funds so that the folks are uh, know that we're here. They are accessing our work and that they don't just wait until something is a crisis to reach out because it's at no cost to the young person or their family to access our crisis phone line, crisis chat, counseling, none of that is at a cost mm -hmm. to the family, which is really something because accessing, you know, private care can be can be uh, costly. We also want to remove waiting lists and waiting wait times. That's been something that has always been a struggle, but we've really tried to work hard to bring down those waiting lists. So there are wait lists for some of our mental health programs, some of the longer programs. Um, but for immediate support, that's why the crisis phone line got implemented. That's why we opened up the crisis chat service because it's for right away. And it's, it's, it's to not wait for a crisis to reach out for that support because you can mitigate a, a risk and a, and a, and a crisis mm -hmm. if you reach out beforehand. Yeah. Like you said, sometimes it, all it, all it could have been is just a simple conversation. And, you know, by, by having that one simple conversation, it just kind of directs, redirects their, mm -hmm. their life decision exactly. uh, by doing something like that before it becomes really a big issue. Um, with that being said, what are some of the challenges that you're seeing specifically around the employment piece? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, Fatty, on the employment side, I mean, people are really encouraged to reach out for that support because we do offer so many different workshops. And someone might come in and say, you know, I need a job today, but they're not they haven't they're not fully prepared for that that type of work. And so getting them skilled up is important. Getting them to do a placement is also a great option to see if that, you know, workplace is is, is right for them. I think that, you know, the workspace has changed, as we all know. There's a lot of hybrid work. Um, and so our employment partners have really helped us to uh, to look at the training that we provide too, to say we really need to help young people to understand how to do a virtual interview yeah. and and also come in knowing that not all jobs will be virtual or completely remote. And, and, you know, there's a new generation coming that, um, that has been very comfortable with virtual only. So I think it's, you know, that's certainly a piece of it and just serving because we serve youth as well as adults in our employment work. Uh, it's, it's really trying to help people to, if they're a newcomer to navigate those systems, um, sometimes beyond just the employment piece. We have a lot of newcomers in many of our programs. And so it's giving them the grace and the kindness and the patience to say, we understand this yeah. is a lot for you to navigate. We're going to help you. We're going to really help you. You know, I think about uh, when the pandemic hit and young people were applying for CERB, our youth workers were helping them to fill out forms online. You know, if some of them were that was a daunting ex exercise for them. It's really helping them in whatever way they need because every young person coming through our door, whether it's employment or mental health or justice or our shelters and housing, they all have different needs. They're all individuals. And so it really is our staff's responsibility and commitment to look at that individual uh, and exactly yeah. what it is that they need. Yeah, it sounds like it's a win-win as well, too, for the employers, I find, because you know, especially now with the market that we're having with like, not being able to find the right expertise mm -hmm. and the right skilled uh, skilled workers mm -hmm. as well, too. It's actually, it's more of a, a, an employee market than it is an employer market at the moment. So it's really helpful, I think, to, to get those employers from the start kind of conditioning or training or, you know, giving the skills for the candidate to to make sure that they're, they're having the next candidate available. Uh, so definitely you guys kind of have the, the perfect approach for it to kind of getting them 
a little bit early and getting the employer a little bit early to kind of help you with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, figuring out that. Um, when it comes to justice, how has it been for you guys and, and what are some of the challenges that you're having as well too to keep the funding and to keep the program going? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, there were challenges certainly in the last few years with other uh, youth justice facilities closing. And so it put more pressure, certainly on us. Our facility has been full, absolutely full. And I think that, you know, we're seeing young people who are, who have a lot of mental health needs as well and who need that support. Some of them just, you know, again, no disrespect to, to families, but some of those young people just have not had support at all. And many of them have experienced really, really troubling trauma uh, and so, again, it's for our team, our youth justice team to to show that compassion. Obviously, you know, there's there's structure when a young person comes into our youth justice programs because they need that structure. They need that support. They need to be heard. Uh, but they also need access to all the things that will keep them and their and their minds engaged. And so we have a full size gym full-size workout room at our youth justice facility, an on-site classroom, mental health support. It's not a locked room. I, I think that that's really important because when we think of those two words, youth justice, you know, what do we all think of? And so, yes, there's structure around their days. We have to keep each of them safe. We have to hear them, understand them, provide that really compassionate support, but all the other things to also keep them as well as possible physically, mentally, and their souls engaged as well. So we've got a library, just all the things that you would think of a young person needing, we try to have on site. Yeah. And if you were to think a little bit just between the four pillars, which one seems to have the most challenges in your opinion? I think they all have unique challenges. I think, you know, our, our shelters and housing that is, you know, quite a going concern because, again, it does bring a lot of our other programs and expertise to that young person. But if a young person is not housed, we always say if you support a young person to find a home, you are going to help prevent adult homelessness. And we don't see youth homelessness in our city. We don't we don't walk by a building and assume that a young person out, standing outside is is homeless, first of all. Our shelters and housing buildings are not identified uh, the way that an adult shelter would be. And so I think that it's a bit of a hidden challenge, um, youth homelessness, but it exists. I mean, we have upwards of 1,400 youth in Ottawa any given year who are struggling with homelessness. And about 40% of them are youth who belong to the LGBTQ2S plus community. So that in itself is, is really challenging. We are able to house upwards of about 150 youth every night in our two shelters and our four buildings, housing buildings. And um, what's really interesting, I will mention too, is with all the challenges that we see in, in shelters and housing, there are, there are youth in our four long-term housing buildings who are born leaders. They've never perhaps had the opportunity to have a voice, but they now have um, created youth tenant committees at each of those buildings, each of those four long-term housing buildings, because they are uh, they have a voice. They want to be involved in the building. They want to say, "Let's make a garden. Let's have a pride prom here. Let's have a pizza night. Let's 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 bring some family members in." So we've really adapted in the last few years to really encourage that. We are an organization that talks about walking alongside youth, not in front of them. Mm -hmm. And if we are going to be, we want to be held to that, to that philosophy that, that that's our goal is to walk alongside a young person. Most know what they need, sometimes not. They just need to kind of have it, you know, brought out of them. Um, and I think that those tenant committees have really done some incredible work. And our shelters and housing team have also done some interesting, really interest, interesting training recently called uh, restorative practices. And it's based on uh, indigenous practices of conflict resolution, of coming together for, uh, you know, a common, a common goal. And so we're seeing that starting to really blossom in those young people in uh, not only the long-term housing buildings, but also in our shelters, which is great. And I, 
you know, again, our staff, I, I just always want to send kudos to our staff mm-hmm. who work with these young people on, a, on good days and bad. And they, they don't let go. They, they really, they really work with that young person to make sure they're safe and secure, yeah. but also are part of the community. We don't want them to, to, to lose that piece. And that's the thing too, like the biggest thing that you mentioned at the beginning is that engagement, right? If I'm not engaged as a, as a youth or even as an adult, it's the chances are, I'm, I just don't feel like I'm being heard or listened to or whatever the case may be. And then it just kind of started diverging and then creating that sort of sense of loneliness and, mm-hmm. you know, start maybe taking on crime and other things. What I wanted to ask you is just from your experience working with USP, what are some of the sort of the telling signs of someone is suffering or some, someone needs your assistance? It's really different. If I think about mental health, you know, something that really, really grew during the, the pandemic the last few years is disordered eating. And if you think about mm-hmm. the pandemic, you think about people posting videos about this is me minus 20 pounds or this is me, you know, I'm struggling with my eating you know, there are things to look for. There are things to, you know, in that case, refusing meals or walking away from the dinner table or uh, being alone in their room for long periods of time. I mean, it's really, it's really, it really varies by program in terms of what does a struggle look like. Um, But I think parents will often have a sense of something. Maybe they don't know exactly what it is. A young person might be struggling with anxiety. And if you don't know what that looks like, it can look like, you know, nighttime being just fraught with with uh, worry and a young person saying, like, I can't quiet my mind. Um, I mean, you know, we probably all have struggled with variations of that or something similar in in some periods of our lives. And it, and that is not unique to adults. Young people, it, again, they, they're they on social media. They see a lot of things going on in the world. They can really take that on their shoulders and, and it weighs heavy on their minds. Yeah. And so, you know, I think it's family conversations are so important. We think sometimes as parents, our kids aren't listening. They are, li- they are definitely they're listening. listening. They are always listening. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I think it's, um, we have a uh, little, what we call wallet cards. They're, they're um, all about our mental health services. We leave them everywhere. Uh, we, you know, I go for, um, let's say to massage therapy, I leave some with the massage therapist. And she said, you know, I noticed that the stack of cards, I've got one left. Can you bring more next time? So, you know, I think it's it's leaving, it's having conversations with young people, whether you're a parent, an educator, um, the, the, the idea of mental wellness has really been part of the conversation now for a few years. I think back 10 years, 20 years, nobody talked about that the way you talked about, you know, your, your body, you break a leg, it's very visible. If something is happening in your mind, it's not visible, but at least we talk about it now. Yeah. And those conversations are getting normalized. And, you know, teachers have a, have a great eye on, you know, young people in their classrooms at, at all ages. And, and we have a lot of educators that tap into our work to say, what can I do? What can I provide in the classroom? Would you come in and speak about YSB services? And so there is such a great appetite for knowledge and to keep the conversation going and to act on things. Don't wait. Don't let something kind of, well, I think there's something happening here, but I'm sure it will work its way out. You know, you have to make things available to a young person. Sometimes you have to really encourage it yourself. But what we're always saying is just reach out for a conversation. You know, you don't have to call it a counseling session. Give us a call for a chat. Have, let's have a conversation. And that's true for parents as well. Like, let's help a parent navigate a difficult conversation mm-hmm. if they're noticing something with one of their young young people. And in your opinion, like, what are some of the ways that the parents can actually help themselves other than just the conversation? Like, is there any other sort of prevention measures out there that we can put together from a especially on the mental health side. Mm -hmm. We have parent groups that are involved in some of our programs that are sort of longer term programs and it's supporting each other. I think that your own wellness is also important. You know, we think that young people in our, in our houses are not listening to us. They're watching us. They are listening. And so modeling, you know, great 
um, health and wellness is really important. If we're all sitting at the dinner table with our phones, you know, we're waiting on a call. I mean, sometimes that does happen, but if that becomes a, a habit, then it, you know, your your kids are going to see that and 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 follow that as well. I think that we're all really attuned now to the benefits of nature. Getting out to, you know, to go for a walk, a family walk. A, I know with my young daughter, she's 23 now, and used YSB services before I even joined YSB. And we didn't know that she was struggling with anxiety. We had no idea what it was. But nighttime was really difficult for her, and she couldn't quiet her mind. Getting out in a for a car ride was beautiful because she didn't have to look at me but we would have some of the best conversations yeah and and I wouldn't I learned not to always say how are you is anything wrong you know those are sort of typical questions that as a parent we may ask but it was really about is you know are you having a day what's 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 your what's your day is it one or a ten or is it a five and that would sort of lead the conversation because if she said oh it's a 10 I'm it's a it's a great day I finish this art project there goes the conversation in that direction if she says it's a five then it might be a different conversation you know and I think that our counselors our mental health counselors are so knowledgeable in terms of helping a parent navigate a conversation uh, an issue a struggle in the home that's what we are here for 24 hours a day yeah. seven days a week so just looking forward to uh, the next chapter with uh, YSB, what's what's the focus going to be like? What are you guys thinking? Uh, where do you want to take it going mm-hmm. forward? Yeah, you know, we, we rely on young people to help guide our work. Um, we have a youth cabinet that we work with at our foundation. We have peer supporters that work in our organization who are young people that work with us part time and are paid for their work who have lived experience with us. And so they help us really look at where are where are the services needed? Where do we need to increase? You know, one of the areas was disordered eating that during the pandemic, we really needed to add additional training for our mental health staff in that area mm-hmm. to help provide that support. Uh, we are about to go into strategic planning in early 2025. And so that will enable us to look at all of our programs because it's quite a large organization to say, where are we going with housing? Where are the pressures? Where, uh, you know, what do we need on the youth justice side? Uh, look at all the ways that we are not siloed in our work. It's really looking at what are the pan, our pan agency priorities so that we're serving youth as best as possible and that our processes are efficient, that we're using collaboration tools yeah. internally, just like a business would, you know, um, using being as efficient as possible with our work, but helping um, having those young people guide our work as well. Absolutely. And um, just, again, looking at the future, future planning is always is always uh, a good sort of strategy for business. And specifically when it comes to nonprofit is making sure that, you know, you're putting back into the society of what you're, you know, supposed to. We mentioned that, the, you know, lately you've been having some sort of difficulty with uh, the housing program. Any plans to expand that in the city and then be able to host more? And if so, what does that look like for you guys? I think that will definitely come out in our strategic planning because we own our buildings. We own our two youth shelters and our four long-term housing buildings. And so we are landlords. We are working with young people to keep them safe in their units. But they do sign a lease when they're in our long-term buildings, uh, not in the shelters, but definitely because we're getting them used to what the real life yeah. real life exactly and so you know they have to make a commitment we make a commitment to them and they also make a commitment to us to keep their units you know uh safe and clean etc but i think what will really what will really shine a light on uh our housing and a uh, shelters moving forward is what what is the need in our city because it's not diminishing um, and so how can we best support that? Are we going to look at a future capital campaign to build on an existing site that we have? Mm-hmm. That's very possible. But again, I think that will all come out of our strategic sure. planning. Well, mm-hmm. especially with, with market rents are, that are all time high and, and you know, real estate has never been more high in prices than That's it has right. been in the last like two or three years. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely that need is just going to keep growing and growing. So 
uh, I hope that's part of the planning for you guys and uh, hope to, you know, maybe in a year from now we're having that conversation. We know a little bit more about where, where that's heading. Mm. Patty, thank you so much for, you know, giving us your time and, and letting us know about this wonderful foundation in the city. USB has been around for 60 some years and would love to kind of know a little bit more about it. And for folks that are watching ysb.ca, YS, YSB.ca that's, right. that's the, the website. Uh, make sure you go and, and, you know, take a look at the program and see where you can help. It's definitely something that's close and near to all our hearts. At the end of the day, we're shaping young minds here that are that could potentially go one way or another. We have that ability to to divert it. We have that ability to kind of help and, and come in at an early stage to prevent that from happening. So why wait? Again, thanks, Patty. Really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, if you guys like what you see, please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe so you can get more and more alerts about episodes like this and hit the bell icon so you can actually get the alerts right to your email. Thanks again.